Okay, I hope every everyone is okay. Um, this is the uh, this is this will be the last session before uh, before the Christmas break. Um, and as ever, I find it incredibly um, disconcerting how quickly the uh, the Christmas uh, how quickly the end of the year comes around. So let me just put the. Um, uh, I'm just going to put the Google link in the um, in the chat, and hopefully that will take you to the to the place where you can register. Okay, right. Now, uh, at this point, I'm just going to close the video settings because I don't know what the hell it's doing. I've got no idea. I can't see anybody else's video, which is a bit strange. Uh, um, but anyway, okay. So, um, let me just open my uh, open my slides for today. Um, so, can I just ask, has anybody got any questions or anything uh, about what we've what we've been talking about uh, over the la or any comments uh, over the last uh, over the last few sessions? Anybody got uh, got any any burning uh, burning questions or burning things that they want to they want to share? Okay, I'll assume that that's a uh, that's a that's a that's a not. So um, if that's the case, let me just see where I will share. And here, let's see if this will let me do it. This is okay. Share my screen. Uh, okay, right, it's coming up. Just a bit slow today. Um, Select this one. I'm going to start sharing, so you should see my screen come up. Can you see? Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Yes, you can. Okay. Right. Fine. Good. Okay. So, um, what what I wanted to what I wanted to talk about today. Um, I wanted to introduce something that we've sort of, I think we've sort of mentioned in uh, in various parts of this, let's say this uh, rather rather broad excursion around different aspects of um, uh, different aspects of talking about the environment. So um, we've gone from. We've gone from talking about uh, uh, ecosystems. We've talked about uh, energy. Uh, we've talked about um, uh, cities. We've talked about and how cities are uh, at the forefront of um, of this. This, let's say, adapting to this um, these climate, uh, this climate emergency, let's say, because most people in the world now live actually live in cities, um, and so let me just see, it's going to be this one, I think. Okay, and so uh, and since since the cities are places where uh, a lot of activity is uh, is happening. Um, the, it, it's actually very important that uh, um, that cities uh, that cities adapt um, and that we make cities work in the in the best possible ways because, of course, there's a lot of possibility for um, uh, let's say total chaos, um, and so things are definitely uh, let's say things are definitely changing. Things are definitely. Um, See, yeah, th things are definitely um, uh, no longer. Uh, it's no longer business as usual, and we will, we will have to look very closely at um, how uh, how we uh, how we live our lives going forward, whether we're in the city or whether we're uh, in the in the countryside. Um, but 
thinking about the actual um, uh, the effect of, uh, of climate change itself, climate change itself, um, these effects are driven by um, greenhouse gases. They're driven by the ap by the chemistry of the atmosphere, and the intention here is not to is not to go deep into the let's say the the the, uh, um, the details of the chemistry uh, within the uh, um, when we're talking about uh, um, uh, climate change in terms of greenhouse gases, but it's to introduce uh, introduce uh, the the topic because notice this is greenhouse gases in in the plural. It's not just uh, it's not just one, and I think everybody uh, would be. Um, Everybody would agree that uh, we all know about carbon dioxide, because carbon dioxide is the uh, is the greenhouse gas which everyone um, thinks about, because it's the one which is already which is always in the news. Let's say. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to have a look at uh, some of the let's say some of the the, the alter the other, um, I would say the alternative, the other, uh, let's say, actors in this play, um, we're going to have a look at uh, how they um, how they are seen within the uh, within the system, let's say. Um, and so I'm going to introduce at the end. I'm going to introduce a little bit about the the sorts of um, the sorts of activities that people do uh, in order to um, in order to make models of the uh, of the atmosphere and how these models are used to um, foresee, let's say, look into the future for, to foresee what might happen. Um, under certain conditions, okay. Um, now, I think you're probably all aware that models are widely used, but maybe you're not so sure about um, how uh, or where these models actually come from, or how they are made. Uh, and the idea is to give you some sort of, let's say, uh, some sort of um, input into um, uh, into sort of showing how um, these models are put together. Okay. Okay. So uh, we're sort of at the end of we're sort of at the end of the year. We've got a few more sessions uh, in January and uh, in February uh, at the beginning of February, and then we'll be uh, we will be uh, we'll be done. Um, so I hope that this has been a I hope that this has been a um, a reasonably interesting um, set of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, encounters, whatever they are. I'm not sure whether they're lectures or whatever, but um, hopefully this has been, uh, it's just given you some ideas. Okay, so um, why do we focus on carbon? Okay, so um, there's a lot of a lot of talk about carbon. Carbon dioxide as the uh, as the greenhouse gas. Um, well, quite simply because um, there's actually quite a lot of carbon in the atmosphere in the form of CO2, um, and as a consequence of human activities, um, approximately 35 billion tons of carbon dioxide are being added to the atmosphere every year now. 35 billion tons, which is 35 trillion kilos. It, these are huge numbers, um, but of course the Earth is a reasonable size, and the atmosphere is quite is quite big. It's quite uh, um, it's quite broad. It's quite deep. So there's lots of let's say space. There's lots of room for uh, for these gases. Um, but the problem is the uh, it's the effect that uh, it's the effects that this gas has on the energy balance of the Earth, and I think we talked in one of the earlier uh, sessions um, about how um, essentially we have um, we have an we have a, a sort of an equilibrium situation, which is that um, the, the Earth receives energy from the sun. Um, 
and that energy is either reflected or absorbed by uh, by certain parts of the earth um, and things which are absorbing the energy are uh, can be molecules they can be uh, substances like rocks or the ocean of course and the atmosphere itself which is made of uh, made of nitrogen oxygen and other stuff um, all of these things can absorb uh, energy to a certain extent but what then happens is that energy is dispersed through the Earth's system okay and okay let me just copy the there's a link for the Google form again okay let me just here it comes right there we go okay so um, so what's happening is this energy is, di is being diffused through the system um, so it's either been radiated back or it's being uh, it's being accumulated and what will happen um, uh, and what also happens is the earth uh, loses uh, some energy so you've got this this let's say this flow and so the the resultant let's say energy content of the earth in terms of how much it's taking in will depend on um, will be will depend on how much is coming in and how much is going out and what factors are working to to trap the energy within the earth system and um, co2 is one of these uh, is one of these factors it's one of these uh, molecules which um, to a much larger extent than uh, the other components in the atmosphere um, it's uh, simply because there's so much of it um, it has this uh, this property of trapping uh, of trapping heat okay so um, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at uh, carbon dioxide but also some of the other gases which are important um, and I'll give you the reasons why these are important to uh, to take into consideration um, and let's just see two seconds okay no I don't want that one okay um, so one of the one of the points is that um, this system is dynamic but the dynamis, 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 dynamic state of the system is such that um, it's, it will depend on how long things are taking the heat and how long they are holding on to the heat before they release it okay so in this case carbon dioxide is uh, a molecule which may enter the atmosphere today um, but it will hang around for quite a long time and so its effects will last with time and so this is one of the things which makes the dynamic rather let's say difficult to uh, rather difficult to study okay so um, we know that um, human activity and particularly modern human activity is associated with industry which as I've said many times we just have to look around ourselves to see the sorts of products of this uh, economic and industrial activity um, <coughs> in which of course we play our active part as consumers uh, and maybe as producers according to where we work um, so the the thing of course is that the, the these industries need energy this energy where does it come from it comes from carbon rich fuels um, and carbon rich fuels of course are burned in order to get the uh, the energy from the from the component molecules that's why we we use combustion it's because it's an extremely extremely uh, energy um, uh, energy efficient process in the sense of uh, there's a lot of energy um, in the uh, in oil and in uh, carbon um, if we can tap into the exothermic reactions which uh, which occur with uh, through combustion okay so um, 
so while most of the most of the activity, most of the current debate at the moment is around carbon and carbon dioxide, um, as I said, there are other important greenhouse gases which also contribute to the um, to this phenomenon. Okay, so. Um, what we need to do is we need to look at uh, think we need to ask the question well why should we study this why should we if we know that it's mostly carbon carbon dioxide why not just focus on carbon dioxide well because um, by just focusing on one we ignore the fact that others can actually be a lot worse over a longer period of time and we will uh, we'll see this um, we, we will see this with uh, some of the examples okay so um, so uh, the greenhouse gases themselves are diverse it's a diverse group of gases um, they vary in um, where and how they are produced so some are produced um, in quite normal biological processes some of them are produced naturally some of them are not um, this has an impact on how they can uh, how they can be controlled uh, in other words what we can do about uh, what we can do about them um, if there are uh, if there are too many, if there's too much, uh, if there's if there's too much stuff, how we can trap it, how we can remove it from the atmosphere, how we can avoid putting it in the atmosphere to start off with. Um, they vary in how much uh, solar heat they are able to uh, they are able to trap. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what this trapping actually involves. Um, in, a, in a little while, but um, because for maybe for non uh, maybe for non chemists, it's not so easy to imagine how a molecule can actually trap uh, heat. Um, it gets a little bit, let's say, uh, it's a little bit abstract. The idea. Um, they also vary in how long they last once they once they're actually in the atmosphere. Um, what they do there because some of these hang around and just don't do very much at all and they hang around for a long long time others are degraded very very slowly um, with some uh, particular uh, chemical and physical chemical reactions which uh, happen in different parts of the atmosphere um, they vary in how they interact with other gases uh, for example, um, and so they also vary in how we can possibly take them out of the atmosphere. Um, so uh, there's quite a, let's say, there's quite a broad, uh, a broad range of, uh, of things in here. Um, so in general, uh, the greenhouse gases are uh, um, absorbing heat energy or infrared energy from the sun. Now I'm just going to see if I can open my uh, my notepad here because I would like to just like to draw something. Um, the okay, so what's what's happening? Um, well, the okay, let's just see. No device selected. Okay, and this may do it. Just say it could not connect to the device. I do not know why. Just bear with me two seconds. Uh, no, okay, doesn't want to do that. Okay, um, it looks like I'm not. I'm going to have to do this without a without a diagram. Um, okay, so so. How do molecules? How do gases um, absorb energy? Well. There are two, uh, two let's say, uh, main things to think about here. Um, first of all, and I think this is probably intuitive, um, if you if you heat if you heat a gas, um, it expands. Uh, we know about hot air balloons, the Montgolfier brothers, uh, and this. So we have this idea that. Um, heating uh, gases they become less dense and this is because they expand 
Um, why do they expand? Well, because the pressure increases. Um, but if you don't put any constraint on the volume, um, so if you put them in a balloon or if you put them in something which were, which can, let's say, uh, um, change volume in order to accommodate the uh, the, 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 the expanded gas, um, this this will equilibrate the pressure with the atmosphere. But if instead, and anyone who has a pressure cooker will appreciate this. Um, someone has got their uh, microphone open. Can I just ask you to make sure that you, your microphone is switched off, please? Because it's just a little bit distracting. Um, so, uh, a pressure cooker, of course, if you heat the, uh, if you heat the, the stew in the pressure cooker, um, if you heat the stew in the pressure cooker, it will, uh, of course, um, go, it will become Excuse me. Uh, I think it might be Grazia. I'm not sure. Can you? Yeah, OK. Thank you. <laughs> no. Someone has got their microphone open. OK. I just want to make sure. It's, it's not. It's not I, I don't mind people having microphones open if, they, if, if it's quiet. But if it's not, uh, it's a bit of a bit of a distraction for everybody so um, okay so yeah so the, the pressure increases as you heat the gas up or as you heat the, the liquid up in the pressure cooker um, what's the pressure caused by well the pressure is caused by the molecules or the uh, yeah the molecules of the gas or the atoms of the gas moving around faster okay uh, and the pressure that is actually caused by the uh, these molecules hitting the container, hitting the walls of the container, which is how we uh, how we perceive pressure, how we measure pressure. Okay, um, so that's one uh, that's one way of let's say absorbing energy and doing something with it. it it's translational. In other words, it it causes movement. You get more um, the gas molecules are moving around more quickly. Um, but there is also another way of absorbing heat energy and this is more to do with the type of molecule itself um, and this explains why um, different molecules will absorb different amounts because essentially when you have uh, when you have uh, molecules uh, take a molecule like co2 so you have um, one carbon atom joined to two oxygen atoms um, and they're sort of arranged in a line and when when the CO2 molecule gets some energy, uh, absorbs some energy, um, it can start to vibrate. Now it can vibrate in different ways because uh, when it when we say it's vibrating, we're talking about the bonds, okay? Because the bonds are what hold the atom, what hold, uh, what are hold, sorry, what holds the atoms together, or what hold the atoms together, okay? Um, so these bonds vibrate and they can vibrate uh, let's say so the atoms are uh, coming closer and going further away from each other a bit like um, a bit like a spring if you like um, but they also vibrate by wobbling okay so they can move backwards and forwards um, and so you can if you can imagine taking a spring um, you can have it either compressing and uh, um, and expanding, or you can have it shaking, wobbling. Okay, so essentially, this uh, this is a way of molecules, uh, a way for molecules to uh, to absorb energy. But what happens is that these molecules are also moving around, and when they move around, they hit stuff. They hit other molecules, and they hit uh, solids. They hit mountains. They hit buildings. They hit people. Um, and every time they're hitting something, they transfer some of this energy, okay? Um, and whatever they hit starts to vibrate a little bit faster or a little bit wobble a little bit more, uh, okay? So the end effect is that the heat, heat energy, which is this, uh, this vibrational energy, is dispersed through the system as basically the the gas molecules collide with 
everything <laughs> everything uh, the, the solids on the surface the, the, the people on the surface of the planet uh, and each other in the atmosphere okay so this is the let's say the source of the uh, of the heat um, but there's also something else we need to we need to remember about the greenhouse effect which is that uh, which is that the greenhouse effect in itself excuse me excuse me I don't know who I don't know who it is uh, yeah can you close your microphone please Julia can you switch your microphone off please okay um, excuse me okay maybe Th thank you thank you <laughs> sorry to <laughs> sorry to keep uh, okay um, something that we should remember though is that the greenhouse effect itself um, no no it's okay it's okay it's just uh, sometimes we forget um, the greenhouse effect itself is not actually a bad thing because um, it actually makes our planet livable um, and so uh, it's it's what we call or what is called the the Goldilocks uh, the Goldilocks effect, which is that um, we need a little bit or we need a bit, but we don't need too much. And it's when things when it gets too much that it becomes uh, uh, becomes a bit of a problem. And in a way, in a way, this sort of illustrates how delicate the balance of these things actually is. Um, so we have to be, uh, we have to be, let's say, um, careful. Okay. So, of course, the Earth, the Earth system itself is is not a static system. Um, we know that uh, the Earth. Uh, the geography of the Earth changes as the geology is very active. We have a, a molten core uh, upon which um, upon which uh, there is a, there is the mantle, uh, and there is the um, there is a layer of um, of magma which uh, uh, wor which works as a as a sort of like a, a sea upon which the uh, the continents float. And uh, of course, everything is uh, is dynamic and moving around. Um, and in the past, uh, there have been times when the Earth's temperature has been a lot higher than it is today. Um, and in many respects, people, in many respects, uh, scientifically, the current, let's say, um, the current period is almost the end of an ice age in a way however we shouldn't read too much into these terms in terms of uh, what the names that we give them because um, uh, we think of an ice age as being uh, being rather extreme which it which it is but just as uh, just as extremely hot conditions in the Cretaceous were rather extreme considering uh, considering how we are as as mammals, and also um, uh, the let's say the the nature of our uh, our interaction with the Earth, which is uh, also based on uh, the fact that we uh, we have developed uh, civilization. Our civilization has developed um, in under conditions which are relatively relatively cool. Um, and it's difficult to see how uh, we could adapt uh, to extreme conditions uh, very, very, uh, very quickly. Simply because the extreme conditions bring with them um, the fact that we are changing the atmosphere. We're trapping more heat. If there is more heat being trapped. Um, remembering that this heat is energy and this energy has to be dispersed it has to go somewhere um, it's getting passed into the molecules of the atmosphere causing uh, causing a, a relatively let's say a relatively stable climate to become much more unstable um, and we've seen 
we've seen some rel we've seen some examples of this just recently with the um, the tornadoes in uh, in, the, in America. Uh, it's not unusual for uh, the, um, the the states which were affected to uh, have tornadoes or to be hit by tornadoes, um, but it is rather unusual uh, for so many so strong at this time of the year. Um, and so what we're seeing is this changing of, uh, let's say, relatively uh, stable type of phenomena into things which are becoming, uh, behaviors which are becoming a lot less stable. Um, the other one, of course, is the, uh, is the hurricane uh, season, which has, become, uh, which has become longer and which has become richer in terms of there are more, uh, there are more storms um, forming. So, okay. So this is uh, this is obviously the uh, the effect of these uh, greenhouse gases. So, which which gases are we talking about here? Well, um, we're talking about two which are based on uh, which are based on carbon. That is carbon dioxide and methane. Um, two very different, uh, two very chemically very different gases because carbon dioxide is, um, is an oxidized form, whereas methane is a reduced form. Um, the carbon dioxide itself is, uh, part, of, uh, is part of the so-called uh, carbon cycle. Um, um, natural methane is too, uh, but it's a, minor, it's a minor part of this. Uh, However, the methane itself is produced in, as we will see, in many different, uh, in many different contexts, uh, some of which are rather surprising, perhaps. Um, but as you can see from the diagram here, the, the big contributors at the moment or, uh, are uh, for about three quarters of the greenhouse gases uh, in terms of importance are uh, carbon dioxide from uh, forestry uh, and land use combined with uh, fossil fuel use and industrial processes. Um, other important gases are the, uh, are the nitrogen uh, based nitrous oxide uh, N2O uh, which is formed uh, during uh, certain industrial processes but also uh, during combustion. Um, and then we have the fluorinated gases, which may be a little bit more esoteric uh, in terms of maybe you're not so, uh, not so familiar with these. Um, but as you will see, these can have uh, very, very big, uh, very big effects. So uh, even though they're present in relatively small amounts, um, it's not the percentage let's say the, the amount that's important is actually their, um, their ability to uh, amplify, uh, amplify heating effects. Okay, so uh, what type of effect do um, greenhouse gases have? So if we're going to look at that, we need to think about how to measure, uh, how to measure them in terms of quantities. Now, um, you may have come across uh, the measure of PPM, parts per million. Um, for those of you who are not, uh, maybe not so technical, um, this might be a little bit difficult to, co let's say, comprehend in the sense of what does it actually mean? We have an idea about what a kilo is, we have an idea about what a gram is, but um, a PPM, it's a bit more abstract. So, um, this is a uh, this is a, a drawing or dry diagram taken from a, a website which is which is trying to uh, explain uh, the idea of PPM, and um, it's saying that it cu currently the uh, the carbon dioxide level is around about 400 parts per million in a room, a re relatively sort of relatively small, normal sized room in a house. Um, this corresponds, to, so this is a room which is about six meters by six meters by about three meters tall. Um, this corresponds to 
uh, an amount of about 12 litres of material, which 12 litres sounds like a lot, but it's not in, in a room this size. I think you can, you can sort of make, it, make the proportion, okay? Um, if you want, one part per million is equivalent to about one drop of water in about 50 litres of liquid. So it, do, but it doesn't sound like enough. It, or, sorry, it doesn't sound like a lot. Uh, and I think this is where um, this is where part of the Pardon, sorry, I don't think we can hear you. Okay, uh, can anyone hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes? Oh, jeez. Yes, we can. Okay, we can hear right. you. Okay, okay. I'll stop, I'll stop swearing. Okay. Um... Okay, yeah. So I was I was just saying that uh, I think one of the one of the problems with the with all of this stuff is that the numbers are either too small or they're really big, and so people who are not used to dealing with uh, dealing with these things, it's easy to ignore. Ah, but you know, uh, 400, 400 parts in a million. That's uh, that's not a lot. It's 0, 0.000 whatever percent, um, and so well, what does that mean? It, it can't possibly be important, and I think this is where uh, this is where we have to we have to let the science, uh, let's say, drive the uh, drive the debate, because um, you cannot argue with the laws of thermodynamics. 
doesn't matter who you are or which uh, which political party you're part of you cannot as as scotty in in star trek used to say you can't you can't change the laws of physics so um okay so the effect of the gases is determined about de determined by how long they actually hang around in the atmosphere um and what sometimes happens is the gases are produced and they stay around and then they decay they decay or they they are removed through natural processes or a series of processes relatively quickly others uh, hang around for thousands of years and so we have quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of let's say variation in this but a key point is and I think maybe we don't appreciate this so well the key point is that um, all of these gases are uh, around in the atmosphere long enough that they are mixed okay so they uh, so they are um, uh, they're mixed right through the atmosphere they diffuse through the atmosphere so it doesn't really matter where you measure where you take the measurements um, you're taking an average of the atmosphere in the across the world in a way um, okay now someone has got their someone's got their um, microphone open if you can just sort of make sure that you've got your micro microphone closed that will be good um, so uh, this is, I think this is an important point because uh, we tend to think of things sort of fairly locally but as I said before the ga these molecules are moving around and they're moving around very quickly and they're moving around all over the place um, and so uh, they will um, they will diffuse across uh, across the world throughout the uh, throughout the atmosphere okay so um, how do we measure this so in order to measure something we need uh, obviously we need to make uh, get some numbers uh, and we need to make some units and um, one of the uh, one of the let's say one of the ways that people uh, try and work with uh, with greenhouse greenhouse gases is to um, have units which you can which allow you to compare okay so we compare so this allows you to compare the effect <coughs> of, oops, excuse me can you switch your microphone off please microphone 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 I don't I don't know who it is they're running around um, let me just get rid of that okay uh, okay no not okay uh, hello get your microphone off whoever you are I can't see okay uh, Fosse Maria Jose Cuadrado you got your microphone off okay right okay anyway here we go so uh, the idea is that you can uh, come up with units which allow you to compare um, uh, which allow you to compare uh, different gases um, now this is a bit complicated I, I will admit that it's not it's not particularly easy um, but one of the things which one of the yardsticks one of the measures which is used is the idea of global warming potential which is a measure of how much energy the emissions of one ton of a gas will absorb over a given period of time relative relative to the emissions of one ton of carbon dioxide okay so the carbon dioxide is being used as a standard and things are being compared to it um, why do it this way well it gives us a let's say an easier way of comparing things so you can say that something is less powerful than co2 or it's more powerful than co2 as a, a global warming gas okay um, the only thing is for 
uh, for greenhouse gases, there's an additional complication, which is that we need to introduce time because some of them last relatively short amount of time in the atmosphere, some of them last much longer. And so we have to, we, we usually say, or it's typical uh, uh, to say that um, it's a greenhouse, uh, sorry, global warming potential um, over a period of 100 years, okay? Now, as I say, this is, it is a bit complicated, but the idea in simple terms is that you are, you're able to compare things, okay? So, uh, so it's clear that some, uh, some gases... Can I switch Ina, can you switch your mic off, please? Okay. Um, so some gases are, are, are more powerful than others, okay? Um, and essentially, what we're what we're talking about is that, or what we're saying is that uh, those with a higher uh, global warming potential are going to be able to absorb more energy per kilo than gases with a low global warming potential. Now, let's remember this: that what you have is you've got energy coming in. Um, you've got different gases absorbing different amounts of energy because of their physical uh, or their chemical structures. Um, and so uh, a gas which is able to absorb more energy eventually will release that energy over time. Yeah, remember, because they're, they're moving around, they're hitting each other, they're hitting mountains, they're warming up rocks, they're hitting people. Um, and so they're transferring this energy in every time they collide they're transferring this energy and so if they have if they if they take in a lot of energy they can transfer a lot of energy uh, so um, what we are what we're looking at is we're looking at uh, the, G, the the global warming potential um, if a gas has a high GWP, it will um, transfer. It will absorb and transfer this energy more, uh, more, um, more. Uh, whereas if it has a lower GWP, it will uh, contribute less to warming because it doesn't have so much energy that it will transfer. Okay. Um, water vapor. Now, water vapor uh, wasn't on the original graph, but this is re uh, on the graph of the global, uh, sorry, of the greenhouse gases, um, for a simple reason, that although it is in potential, it is in principle a greenhouse gas, because water molecules are able to absorb heat, um, and they're able to um, re-emit it through. Uh, uh, through collisions, etc., as uh, low grade, low grade, low grade heat. Um, but the thing is, uh, water is an extremely dynamic part of the atmosphere, so um, a lot of that energy is dispersed almost immediately through rainfall, through condensation, uh, through uh, snowfall, and so um, overall, water vapor doesn't have. A particularly strong effect as a uh, as a greenhouse gas itself. Um, water vapor does uh, impact the reflection of solar radiation. So it's well known that um, the uh, that clouds will uh, affect the what's called the albedo, or, uh, uh, which is the reflective power of a surface. Um, more clouds make the surface of the Earth uh, cooler because, of course, they, the sun, uh, the warmth of the sun, is not getting through. Um, at the same time. Um, Air which is hotter or air which is warmer is able to hold more um, more moisture, um, which can cause uh, torrential rainfall, rainfall and violent storms when it uh, condenses. So, uh, water is part of the system, but as far as a greenhouse gas is concerned, we don't consider it as a greenhouse gas because it's part of the uh, it's part of the very dynamic uh, water cycle. Okay, so um, 
CO2, looking at CO2 very briefly, but I'm sure that we're, we're sort of well aware of, uh, of CO2 in its role. Um, it's the reference gas, as I pointed out, and it's the primary greenhouse, greenhouse gas, um, which is uh, emitted through um, human activities. Uh, in 19, sorry, in 2019, it was approximately 80% of all greenhouse emissions um, in the US. The figures in Europe are very similar. Um, this is simply because of its, uh, its close connection with energy, um, whether that be for heating or whether that be for industrial, uh, industrial use. Okay? Um, the complication with carbon dioxide is that it is naturally part of the carbon cycle, it's naturally present in the atmosphere, um, and so, of course, uh, this uh, reflects in the fact that um, we have, let's say, life, carbon-based life on Earth, and we have plants and animals um, in both, on both land and in the, in the oceans. Uh, and so we have this very, let's say, dynamic carbon cycle, which is um, cycling, uh, uh, cycling CO2 from the atmosphere into uh, into plants, in from plants into soils through decomposition, uh, and through soils back into the atmosphere through uh, respiration and. Um, uh, decomposition processes. So, uh, as we pointed out in different, in another. ¿Cómo va el coche más ligero con una o con dos personas? Mira. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, okay. So the the thing here is to. Um, is that the uh, is that we have um, also the fact that human activities are not just producing CO2 uh, excess CO2 in the into the atmosphere, but also uh, we we are seriously um, affecting the ability of natural sinks such as forests and soils to remove and store CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, so the overall situation is that um, the activity, uh, recent human activity, by recent I mean from 1760, the Industrial Revolution onwards, um, has been to uh, upset the uh, upset the, the dynamics of the of this uh, of the balance. Um, with also with uh, not just with by producing, but also by reducing the ability of um, uh, the natural uh, uh, natural um, resources such as forests to actually absorb um, uh, absorb carbon dioxide. So uh, most of this, as I've said, has happened since the uh, since the the industrial revolution. And um, if we look at where the main where CO2 is mainly let's say, uh, emitted, um, most of it is um, transportation, generation of electricity and uh, industrial use. Um, residential and um, uh, other non-fossil fuel combustion uh, uh, ca accounts for about 20%, not not much more, just a bit under. These figures are from for the US, but the the figures for Europe are not too different. Um, transportation, of course, this is uh, cars. Uh, this is our let's say our um, addiction to our addiction to personal transport. Um, and of course, electricity. This is underpinning. Uh, industry and residential um, uh, residential uh, energy use. Um, in general, uh, between well, you can see from the graph here. This goes from 1960 to up to 2019. Um, the fossil fuel emissions is in general it's increasing, and we can see that okay, it wobbles a little bit, but. Um, in general, it's still uh, we're still talking about 35 to 36 uh, gigatons, uh, billion tons of carbon dioxide being produced uh, per annum. Um, 
so there's, where does this come from? Well, of course, between 1960 and current present day, uh, there's been, despite the uh, various uh, various crashes and what have you, you can see there's a little spike there. It's 2008. Um, there's been a general in, um, a general expansion of uh, of the economy and obviously a growth in uh, in population, and all of this has uh, has driven has pushed the um, has pushed the uh, uh, the production of CO2 uh, across the globe. Um, how can we how can we reduce carbon dioxide emissions? Well, um, I suppose the first thing is to, uh, before going along the uh, before going along the uh, the route of actually trying to do something with the CO2 that's already out there, is to not make it in the first place. So, of course, um, moving away from fossil fuels. So this is moving away from carbon. Um, increasing the efficiency of heating, which also implies increasing the efficiency of buildings uh, in retaining heat, particularly in northern countries. Um, uh, increase the efficiency of transport, so maybe uh, this maybe means uh, cities. When we talked about the, this idea of cities, that um, human-scale cities or human-scale uh, um, areas of, uh, of cities where uh, you have just about everything that you need and you don't need to use the car, this type of thing. And we also have things like um, lifestyle changes, so being able to work remotely. Some people can according to what they do, some people can't. Um, some people could probably do a mix, uh, but all of these things are things which contribute at a, an, ind an individual or a societal level to uh, reducing um, carbon dioxide. Um, I think one of the things that we have to be careful with, uh, and I'm a little bit, I have to say I'm personally a little bit skeptical about it, is the, is the promise which is held out of uh, things like being able to capture uh, carbon dioxide um, and take it from the atmosphere and do something with it, whether that's uh, storing it or whether it's um, converting it, converting it into other things. Um, there was, I think, there was a report a few months ago of uh, the first, the world's first commercial uh, carbon capture uh, station in Iceland. Um, and basically what does it involve? It just involves um, filtering air or pushing air from the atmosphere through uh, chemical reactors such that the carbon dioxide is absorbed in a chemical reaction. Um, that's it in a nutshell. Um, the problem is that carbon dioxide is relatively low concentration in the atmosphere and um, this filtering process requires uh, pushing a lot of carbon, a lot of atmosphere, unreactive atmosphere, because mo because the most of the atmosphere is not carbon dioxide, um, into these chemical reactors, such that the uh, the reactions take place, and so it's actually very slow. It's actually very time consuming. And it's actually very any energy inefficient. Um, I think Iceland, uh, the company in Iceland, are, are running uh, using geothermal energy, which is uh, let's say free, free at source. Um, but this is not something which would be widely applicable uh, across the world. Um, so yeah, I think we have to be a little bit skeptical about the. Um, uh, about the power of being able to actually, uh, on a very large scale, because remember we are talking about 35 billion tons of CO2 a year. Well, that's a lot of CO2, okay? So we need to be thinking about um, efficiency, 
and we need to be thinking about moving away from the carbon-based economy. So this idea of reducing fossil fuel consumption becomes uh, central. Um, there will be roles, of course, for uh, conversion technologies. So whether that's uh, uh, through, uh, uh, for example, the algal algae cult cultivation is interesting because um, you're using photosynthesis, which is a natural. Uh, it's the natural process that plants use to take in uh, CO2 and convert it to uh, complex sugars. Um, this can be used to make biomass. Um, but the biomass could then be bur would then be burned to give you just CO2 back. So you haven't really removed it. You've just uh, you've just made something which is carbon neutral. Um, unless of course you take this biomass and you use it to make uh, biopolymers, bioplastics, uh, or whatever, which have their own particular problems as well. So it's a difficult situation. It's difficult. Um, uh, it's a difficult uh, uh, problem. Um, it's, there is quite a bit of work also on the on the use of uh, carbon dioxide as a chemical feedstock um, for more traditional type of chemistry. Um, certain, let's say, uh, modifications to processes which are uh, already uh, already known or already used, um, and these are, let's say, uh, these are things which could have have a place, but they are relatively, let's say, relatively niche. Um, okay, so that's that's carbon dioxide. Um, this is methane. Um, this is CH4. So it's a uh, it's a relatively relatively simple molecule, um, and it hangs around in the atmosphere for about 12 years. So it's relatively short-lived. However, um, if we compare it to carbon dioxide, we find that methane is actually pretty bad because it's about 25 times uh, more powerful as a greenhouse gas than uh, carbon dioxide. Um, and it is present in, natural, in the natural system. Um, because it is part of uh, it's it's present it's always present in uh, oil fields uh, which as uh, natural gas in some cases we have natural gas fields which are actually um, exploited commercially um, but it's also it's also produced naturally not just from let's say uh, leaks in uh, in rocks or leaks in natural gas systems um, it's also produced naturally during animal husbandry uh, raising of livestock um, and this is because it's produced during um, fer anaerobic fermentation uh, or aerobic fermentation in um, in the guts of uh, of ruminants, okay. So uh, there are lots of uh, there are lots of chemical reactions going on, uh, which bacteria can use, um, which can actually remove methane <coughs> from the uh, uh, from the atmosphere, just as there are other bacteria which actually produce methane. So um, it gets pretty it gets pretty complicated the, the methane let's say the methane cycle is pretty complicated it's a, it's a balance between um, uh, human activities and natural activities uh, and um, one of the biggest let's say one of the biggest uh, producers or one of the biggest contributors are the uh, the ruminants uh, domestic livestock cattle swine uh, sheep, goats, uh, cattle are the ruminants, of course, um, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of CH4, a lot of uh, methane is produced um, during uh, digestion, but also when um, manure is stored uh, or managed. Uh, wherever you have accumulation of uh, agricultural uh, agricultural waste. Um, you have bacteria which are producing uh, which are producing methane, um, 
and it's been estimated that, at least in the US, the agricultural sector is the uh, largest source of um, uh, methane emissions. Um, however, there are other sources of methane emissions in um, uh, in natural environments or in land management activities such as forests and grass, forests and grassland fires, um, decomposition of organic matter in uh, coastal wetlands, and it, as I say, it does get a little bit complicated. Um, it's the primary component of natural gas, uh, and it sort of basically it leaks out <laughs> at all points in the process uh, during production, processing, storage, transmission and the distribution um, and it's also released during uh, coal mining. Um, you may have seen this type of, uh, this type of thing, this is, a, um, uh, this is a methane collector from a, uh, a landfill uh, because landfills um, which contain uh, mixed waste uh, are um, aerob anaerobic conditions and um, uh, many anaerobic bacteria will produce me methane as a, uh, as a byproduct of their metallic metabolic processes and this can be, uh, this can be in some cases this can be captured and uh, and used uh, successfully for um, uh, energy recovery. Um, of course, the point here though is that we are <coughs> we're capturing the methane and then, we're, then if we burn it, we com we are converting it into carbon dioxide. So um, again, it, this isn't something which is necessarily carbon uh, carbon neutral. Um, wetlands are an important source, um, but another important source, and there's a photograph here, these are bubbles of methane uh, under uh, ice in lakes in the Arctic, um, because the permafrost in Arctic regions contains a large amount of methane which is trapped and unfortunately one of the consequences of, uh, of global warming or of climate change is that these, um, uh, these methane deposits under the permafrost are starting to be uh, released as the permafrost uh, melts thus releasing large amounts of trapped, uh, trapped methane which of course cause an acceleration of the, uh, of the heating process which uh, causes the release of more um, trapped methane. So this is a, poten this is a potential, let's say, uh, a potential time bomb in the sense that it's, uh, it's part of a, uh, a positive, uh, positive feedback and amplifying feedback loop. Okay, um, so if we look at the, don't worry too much about this one. <laughs> don't worry too much about this uh, this one. Uh, this is the one we need to be looking at, and the methane uh, methane concentrations or methane emissions are increasing uh, slowly, uh, but they are increasing, um, and so. Uh, it's going up gradually from about 1980 through to 2010-2020. It's increased from around about 1,600 parts per million, parts per billion. Okay, Laura, just two seconds. I'll, I'll get it for you. I'll get it for you. Um, so it's gone up from about uh, 1,600 parts per billion. Okay, up to about 1,800 parts per billion. Again, these numbers don't sound like uh, don't sound like a lot, but we're talking 360 million tons. Okay, which is a lot. Now let me just see if I can find that link. Copy link. Just two seconds, and maybe it has decided to stabilise a little bit because the connection has been a pain today. Okay, so uh, this is this is methane. Um, 
how could we reduce it? Well, uh, of course, you capture it and then you burn it, but you burn it and you convert it into carbon dioxide. Uh, you can change animal feed to produce to reduce the amount of uh, methane produced during di digestion, um, which uh, that may or may not be uh, uh, something which can be applied on a large scale. Okay, so uh, methane is uh, while we are let's say wedded to and heavily invested in the uh, the use of cheap natural gas um, this is going to be a, a bit of a problem so uh, moving on nitrous oxide so nitrous oxide uh, n2o um, hangs around quite a quite a long time um, it has a very powerful effect in terms of the green greenhouse uh, um, warming or the global warming potential. It's this is compared to carbon. Remember, so this is this is 300 times more powerful than uh, carbon over 100 years. So this stuff is is definitely not uh, definitely not good. Um, now uh, you don't need to worry about the uh, let's say the the numbers here, but what it's saying is that the, the molecule itself is present as a, uh, a linear molecule which um, is able to vibrate and wobble in a number of ways so you can have uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, let's say quite a lot of heat uh, absorbed in this uh, in by this molecule and it's naturally present in the atmosphere as part of the nitrogen cycle however um, while it is present as part of the nitrogen cycle, it's not, uh, and it has a number of natural sources, it's not such a, uh, these are not so, so, so important compared to um, the, let's say, the human produced uh, nitrous oxide. Now, some of you may or may not know uh, that this is also, this is the laughing gas, this is uh, the gas which was, um, introduced in the salons of the 18, early 1800s where people used to breathe this in and uh, used to have the have parties basically um, it's um, it's it's an, an anesthetic uh, it has a uh, an, in very small con quantities it has a euphoric uh, um, effect in larger, slightly larger quantities, it has an anaesthetic effect, and in fact, for a long, long time. But I think even now, it is still used for anaesthesia in dentistry. Um, so, I mean, I certainly remember this from when I was a kid, but that's a different, uh, different story. Okay. Um, most of the, uh, well, about 40%, not most of, 40% of the uh, total uh, nitrogen dioxide emissions uh, present in the world come from uh, human activities, um, typically agriculture, trans transportation, um, and industry. Um, so transportation is uh, one of the, uh, one of those, um, one of those sources which uh, if is linked to the use of the combustion engine. Um, we'll meet this in a minute, um, but it's just, from agriculture it's associated with the fact that we use a lot of fertilizer. Um, and it's associated with uh, practices such as the use of, of manure and burning uh, agricultural residues. So um, here, if we're going to reduce, if we're going to cut this down, we need to be thinking about alternatives to uh, alternatives to the use of um, these fertilizers uh, and also uh, alternative uh, crop, uh, cropping practices. Um, on the other hand, um, N2O or the, the, the nitrous oxide is uh, is part of the combustion process in the sense that uh, clearly we're burning fuel 
with oxygen, but of course we are burning this in, a, in, a, in an atmosphere which is air basically, so it's 80% nitrogen. So chemically speaking, there's enough energy in here that you will produce uh, nitrous oxides uh, and amongst other things as byproducts simply because of the fact that you are not using pure oxygen. Um, but you wouldn't want to use pure oxygen in an engine because that would be... Um, unless it's a rocket of course um, so um, in industry uh, it's nitrous oxide is a byproduct of making chemicals such as nitric acid which is used to make uh, fertilizer um, and it's also used in the production of uh, this acid here, dipic acid, which is used to make nylon. This is a classic uh, school experiment where you're making nylon as you pull it up. But um, the point is that it, it, some industrial processes which are used on a very large scale, uh, and nylon is a uh, nylon 6 or nylon 6-6, six six is... Maria, Maria, Maria Jose, can you switch your microphone off, please? Can you close your microphone, please? Okay, uh, so yeah, there are quite a few, let's say, uh, quite a few industrial processes which uh, use or which produce nitrous oxide as a, as a byproduct. Um, it can come out from uh, the degradation of um, proteins, uh, urea, ammonia, in, in settling tanks. This is bacterial production um, uh, during nitrification, denitrification. So uh, this, the, the chemistry, the biochemistry here gets very complex, um, and it's related to microorganisms uh, basically breaking down, uh, breaking down waste waste stuff okay um, so yeah the, the naturally speaking it, it's present because of the um, uh, because of bacteria in the soil or because of bacteria in the oceans um, it's very important that uh, that bacteria are doing this though because um, one of the, of course, one of the key things for plants is plants need nitrogen in order to grow properly, and um, naturally, uh, the nitrogen in the atmosphere is very unreactive, and so getting it into uh, getting it into uh, plants, um, getting it into into soils can be or is very difficult. Some plants have bacteria in their roots. The legumes uh, have bacteria in their roots, which um, are able to use uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere. Um, another way is uh, for it to be, um, uh, let's say, is for it to. Uh, um, be made during uh, thunderstorms uh, with the uh, large amounts of energy of the electric uh, charges passing through the atmosphere uh, causing um, chemical reactions. Um, as far as the balancing is concerned it's reduced Oh, sorry, it's removed by back certain bacteria. So some bacteria make it, some bacteria take it, um, but it's also destroyed um, in the upper atmosphere, in the uh, in the high atmosphere, in the stratosphere, uh, via uh, ultraviolet radiation uh, and a series of chemical reactions. Okay. Um, in general the amount coming from combustion has decreased because of emission standards which have been adopted um, but uh, there is a uh, there has been a corresponding increase in the use of fertilizers so uh, again it's a sort of a it's a bit of a balance okay um, how can we possibly uh, possibly reduce this? Uh, well, we can think about um, better agricultural management. 
uh, practices in terms of how we uh, how we fertilise. Oh, yeah, you can actually every bit, and when I connect, the speaker is. Uh, get the connection every bit, and when I connect, the speaker is connected. Okay. Okay, well, if that if if that happens, okay, I, I know uh, computers happen, do these things sometimes. Okay, so um, as far as uh, as far as uh, nitrous oxide as a pollutant from uh, transport from cars is concerned, um, there are catalytic converters which uh, can destroy the, uh, the molecule, um, and. In terms of production processes in in industry, you can uh, you can modify the uh, the processes to produce uh, uh, to produce less nitrous oxide as a byproduct. As a byproduct. Okay. Now, um, fluorinated gases. Uh, this is a, a family, um, and these are completely synthetic. There are no natural equivalents here. So uh, one of the, I think one of the things that we need to uh, appreciate here is that in some cases we have molecules which do exist already in nature and they are part of natural, cy uh, natural uh, cycles, um, just as there are others which are completely synthetic and they were made or they have been made and introduced and used for particular reasons. So. Um, originally, uh, these were chlorofluorocarbons, and they were um, uh, they were used as they were introduced as refrigerants. So this is these are the gases which are part of the refrigeration cycle that you find for fridges and freezers in in and around the home and in industry and on a large scale. Um, Sometimes they come out from uh, other processes, such as making uh, manufacturing aluminium and uh, making semiconductors. Um, but in general, the the ones that are most familiar are the ones which are associated with uh, refrigeration. Um, there are four main groups of them. Um, we've got the hydrofluorocarbons the HFCs, the perfluorocarbons, the PFCs, uh, and then we have sulfur hexafluoride and nitrogen trifluoride. Now, um, don't, don't worry too much about the, let's say, the, the chemical details of these things. Um, you know, the, the, it's, just a, it's just a set of, uh, a set of molecules, but what you can see here is that if methane uh, and nitrous oxide had methane was 25 times worse than carbon dioxide, um, and nitrous oxide was 300 times worse. Uh, these guys are, let's say, the professionals, <laughs> in the sense that these are many, 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 many more times potent, many times more potent than carbon dioxide. And this is the problem, uh, the fact that even though they are present in relatively small amounts, these small amounts can have extremely, uh, extremely strong effects. So um, the HFCs, the hydrofluorocarbons, uh, they ha they're hanging around for quite a long time. Um, global warming potential around about 15,000 times that of uh, carbon. These these guys, the perfluorinated carbons, uh, uh, these are the so-called uh, forever chemicals, and it's only now that the let's say the long-term effects of these molecules are starting to become uh, appreciated. Um, and these are estimates: 50,000 years. It could it could be longer. Um, very high uh, global warming potential. Um, a simpler molecule, nitrogen trifluoride, uh, a higher global warming potential still, and another relatively simple molecule, sulfur hexafluoride, um, which is hanging around for quite a long time, um, but it has the highest global warming potential, potential of, uh, uh, of all of these uh, molecules. Now, 
as I said, some of these look to be quite um, uh, they look to be quite esoteric, but they are, they find uh, niche uses in uh, in different situations. No, there is spinge. Okay. Um, so, for example, the sulfur he sulfur hexafluoride is um, is used in electrical circuits as a circuit breaker, for example. Uh, so these are rather niche, uh, uh, rather niche uses, but there is still quite a lot produced uh, every year because of its uh, um, its widespread uh, widespread use. Okay, so. Because they hang around for such a long time, these uh, gases are well mixed in the atmosphere, and so they spread all around the world when they after they are uh, released. Um, often they're only re removed by uh, high altitude, high altitude chemistry. So in the far upper atmosphere, where there's enough energy from cosmic cosmic rays and sunlight, um, uh, where there's enough energy around to actually break them uh, break them down. Um, but of course, the concentrations in the high atmosphere are extremely low. So uh, there is a balance, let's say. Um, so they uh, they have a um, They have a, pot uh, a potential to to last for a very long time. Where do we find them? Uh, as I say, some of them may be a little bit more familiar than others. Uh, we find them in uh, as refrigerants, um, aerosol propellants, foam blowing agents. So when you have a um, when you have a, a canister which releases a foam. Um, some of them are used as solvents, and some of them are used as as fire retardants because they don't uh, they don't burn. Um, the main source is um, in uh, in the refrigeration because of their uh, physical chemical properties in terms of uh, expansion and uh, uh, condensation. Uh, they have uh, a high latent heat, so they're able to um, uh, they're able to cool very efficiently. The uh, very efficiently um, uh, in the uh, in the refrigeration cir uh, circuits, and they're used in both uh, vehicles and buildings in air conditioning systems. Now, there may not be a lot in a particular uh, in a particular air conditioning unit. But multiplied by the number of air conditioning units and the fact that air conditioning units are uh, decommissioned and then uh, broken down and re not even recycled, um, a lot of these gases escape into the atmosphere. Um, now, um, you may be wondering why we have um, we have this sort of uh, let's say range. Of molecules, they started off as the chlorofluorocarbons. Um, these were um, the originals, uh, but of course, it became known in the 1970s that they were depleting the ozone layer, stratospheric ozone, ozone layer, uh, and so there was the Montreal Protocol, which uh, led to them being um, phased out. Um, so these guys, the CFCs and the HCFCs, were the original, let's say, targets of the Montreal, Montreal uh, Protocol, and they were replaced by the, um, the hydrofluorocarbons. And <coughs> um, so these are um, uh, oh, these are uh, uh, th these were introduced because they have less effect on the ozone layer okay so we've got these destroy the ozone layer the layer these a little bit less these have no effect on the ozone layer but of course they have uh, as you can see here they have um, a high global warming potential so these are now being phased out in terms of 
uh, a group of compounds which are the um, hydrofluoro uh, hydrofluoroolefins, uh, and these have uh, a relatively low um, uh, warming of warming potential. So um, you don't really need to know about the structures of these things. But the point is that um, a new set of uh, uh, hydrofluorocarbons, because that's essentially what they are, um, is being introduced to replace the uh, ozone depleting substances and also the, um, uh, the hydrofluorocarbons, which are um, uh, which have a, a, a very high global warming potential. Um, what obviously remains to be seen is what sort of effects these guys will have because of course we're replacing one thing with another and we need to understand um, uh, the long-term effects of, uh, of the introduction of this type of molecule. Um, okay. Uh, the perfluoro perfluorocarbons, that's the PFCs, uh, they're produced in a number of different uh, uh, situations industrially, um, uh, along with sulfur hexafluoride, which is used uh, in magnesium processing and semiconductor manufacturing. Um, these guys are pretty, uh, pretty potent uh, uh, global warming uh, gases. Um, this is, if you ever see, if you ever look around, uh, um, if you ever see this type of structure in a an electrical transmission line, this is full of sulfur hexafluoride. These are circuit breakers. Um, and basically when there is a problem, uh, the sol these, these fill with sulfur hexafluoride, which is extremely good at um insulating uh, high voltage uh, high voltage lines because the problem here is this isn't normal uh, this isn't normal house electricity here we've got uh, very very high voltages here and so it's uh, it becomes um, uh, quite dangerous to uh, to uh, to handle and this is one of the best uh, one of the best things which has been found for uh, helping uh, helping this uh, these situ this situation okay so what about emissions and trends this is interesting because this is the uh, 1950s this is the economic boom 1960s everyone suddenly has a house a fridge in the house um, these are the CFCs, the, car the chlorofluorocarbons, um, reasonably stable, but of course the uh, HCFCs are starting to make their mark because, uh, well, the problem with the CFCs is becoming recognised as they are, have a major impact on the um, uh, a major impact on the, the ozone layer. Um, now, I think it's curious because. The, if you look at the time scale for the uh, for the demise of the CFCs, it's actually pretty quick. From about 1990, where you've got peak consumption, to around 2010, uh, so that's you know space of 20 years. And in particular, in the first in the first um, five years, there's a precipitous fall. Uh, uh, in the uh, in the use or in the consumption of these uh, uh, these CFCs, um, this does illustrate uh, this does illustrate the power of uh, of a concerted effort, concerted action, because this is the result of the Montreal Protocol. Um, at the same time, of course, the HCFCs they're increasing, and the HFCs are starting to increase as they have become. Uh, they, they have become uh, um, important as replacements for both of these uh, other things. So um, there's, there's a tale here. The ozone crisis was uh, something which uh, uh, countries uh, re and manufacturers reacted to um, to provide a um, let's say a solution by phasing out the thing which was the things which were causing the problem okay uh, because of the lifetimes um, 
it, the, the stuff which is already there is going to take a long time to, do, to uh, get out of the atmosphere. Um, and so uh, the, best, the best thing is to avoid uh, emitting these gases into the atmosphere in the first place um, using destruction processes, uh, scrubbers in the uh, industrial, um, uh, in the industrial uh, waste uh, cycling and changing processes basically. Um, okay, so uh, a summary here very sort of very very quick is that uh, the greenhouse gases are not just uh, about the carbon dioxide but they are also about um, how much stuff is there uh, and how long things uh, spend in the atmosphere other glass other gases are important because they may be much more potent on a on an equivalent basis than uh, carbon dioxide um, and in particular, it's the fluorinated compounds which are um, particularly uh, uh, long-lasting and uh, extremely potent. Okay, so uh, just looking at a couple of comments on here, and it says about about ozone. I trust the direction of the whole has been amazing. Well, actually, um, Maria Carmen, it's the the reduction the uh, in the ozone hole was already well uh, established as a let's say as a success story, uh, even before the even before the pandemic, um, simply because the um, the molecules which were mostly responsible um, were were the chlorofluorocarbons which have been phased out of uh, refrigeration manufacturing uh, or manufacture since um, since quite a long time so the, reco but the recovery of the model has uh, sorry the recovery of the uh, of the ozone layer has been uh, quite um, uh, quite consistent uh, it's been quite uh, it's been quite positive quite strong yeah Anybody? Does anybody have any questions or comments about the uh, about these greenhouse gases? Hmm. Yeah. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, if if there's if there's no if there's no questions or anything about this. Um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes, the last few minutes, just uh, going through something about, yeah, a positive thing in the middle of a disaster. Um, also, the uh, the reduction in uh, in CO2 emissions from travelling, I think, uh, was also uh, uh, an important uh, an important result. Um, okay, so I'm going to have a look a little bit about um, models. And um, I think one of the one of the let's say one of the debates in the let's say in the diatribe around uh, climate change is that uh, uh, people who um, let's say don't really want to uh, take. Uh, take notice of the the situation will um, quite often say ah yes okay so first of all the numbers are, are really small what do the small numbers mean okay that's one thing but second of all they will say well yeah but it's these uh, the numbers coming from these models they're just models so they're in they're invented they are made up okay and so I think the answer to that type of let's say criticism is that well we are dealing with uh, we're dealing with complex systems and so of course it's not in fact it's impossible to predict how these systems will behave um, without looking at uh, how the systems are structured and how they how they could behave. In other words, looking at uh, under under particular under different sets of conditions. Okay, so 
thinking about models uh, in a, let's say, a more general sense, um, anyone who's, who's ever sort of changed a kitchen or played with Lego um, or played with a flight simulator, these are models of different kinds. Um, of course, they're not, uh, let's say, playing with Lego, making something with Lego is a little bit different to trying to make a model of the, the, the climate of the Earth. Um, but essentially, the, let's say, the, uh, the essence of, of the model is that it helps us understand a complicated problem and helps us understand the different, let's say, aspects of that problem in order to... Um, arrive at some sort of uh, solution. Um, more sophisticated models uh, allow us to test theories and, um, and also test possible solutions. So um, the more sophisticated models allow us to do things like what-if types of thinking. Um, without actually having to run the experiment and that's the that's the point we can't run the experiment with uh, climate with our climate because we are uh, we're in the system okay so um, how do uh, how do these climate models work uh, climate models are incredibly sophisticated um, why are they so sophisticated because another uh, another um, criticism would be well uh, why are uh, why do these models no one understands them why do why does why do these models need to be so uh, complicated well it's a let's say it's a um, it's a principle of this type of approach which is that um, the model needs to. The model it will always remain a model, but it needs to take account of the um, the important factors in the real system in order to come up with an approximation. And of course, the more you are able to uh, take account of the factors, the more of the factors you understand, uh, the better your model will be in terms of being able to to let's say mimic the behavior of the real of the of, of the real observable system um, and so one of the uh, one of the key uh, aspects of the climate modeling is the size of the problem of modeling because you're not lo you're not looking at just a uh, a single area uh, of the world, you're actually looking at the whole planet, okay? And so, how how this is how these models are developed uh, is to use um, <coughs> to use a system where the um, the first of all, you're looking at processes which are well uh, well understood. Um, sometimes, though, they may not be their connections may not be recognised, and a lot of research is uh, is about um, understanding connections between pieces of the system. Um, but since we are actually talking about energy, in the end, that's what we're that's what these models tend to focus on. They focus on how energy is and materials such as uh, gases and such as uh, water are transferred through the system, through the climate system. Um, and so the Earth is divided up into a set of uh, a set of chunks, which uh, are connected to each other. And um, what happens in the in the simulations or in the calculations is that. Um, the flows of things between these chunks are represented with mathematical equations and this um, <coughs> these together build into a let's say a picture of, uh, of the, the climate system itself uh, the complexity of the system uh, itself and Essentially, what's happening is that these uh, mathematical equations, which represent the flows of materials and the flows of energy, um, also uh, are set using uh, or also contain variables 
which um, refer to uh, climate conditions, so temperature, they refer to uh, um, humidity or whatever, um, and energy exchange, how, how, much, uh, how much energy is being exchanged. Um, these, are, um, these are all put together um, using, uh, or these are all put together and they are, they are let's say, solved uh, using extremely powerful uh, computation techniques. So it's clear this, this, this stuff gets extremely, extremely complicated. Um, but essentially it starts with uh, gridding. It starts with dividing the, the world into chunks. The more chunks you have, the more definition you have, and the more computing power you need, but the better the model. Okay, um, and then there is an additional complication as far as climate is concerned, which is time. So uh, you're looking to predict into the future, so you need uh, you need a time element, and that could be um, based on minutes, hours, days, months, years, uh, looking forward. And of course, one of the uh, one of the important aspects of a model is that the better the model. The more it's able to, uh, the more it's able to predict. So, um, one may ask, well, what happens with models? Uh, and you need to test them, and there is a, an interesting process called hind casting rather than forecasting, because forecasting is looking into the future. Hind casting is actually um, running the model backwards into the past which it might sound like a rather curious thing to do, um, but w since we have data from the past, uh, we know what the climate was, we know what the weather was. Um, by running the model backwards, we can see, and we, we run the model backwards from the data for today, uh, with, para with the suitable parameters, we can see how the model uh, behaves with respect to data that we actually have. And this is, why do people do this? Well, they do this to check the accuracy because this is a way of, um, this is a way of making sure that the various equations are, uh, are let's say, are balancing in terms of their, um, uh, their relative importance, okay? Um, and so, of course, there's a, whole, there's a very active, let's say, there's a very active community uh, of people working on uh, climate modelling, which um, involves uh, making models, testing them, and then sharing the, uh, the, the results and the observations. Um, so this is an example of, uh, you start here, this is an example of historical and uh, forecasting. Um, so uh, the idea is to be able to model different scenarios. Uh, so you will put in a scenario for maybe rapid uh, human population growth, or you put in a scenario for um, uh, human population growth stopping at a particular time. Uh, and it can get very, very complicated. Uh, it can get very um uh, very involved, but the whole idea is that you're able to look at different possibilities. So what will happen if uh, carbon dioxide uh, goes over a certain amount, okay? Uh, what will happen if you uh, change, uh, change the um, uh, change the carbon-based economy to a non-carbon-based economy? How soon will it take for the temperatures to come down? This, uh, there's a whole set of, uh, there's a whole set of um, factors involved and it's really about the co this complex relationship between the, uh, the socio-economic factors or the forces which are driving the greenhouse gases and the aerosol emissions which is based on um, based on 20th century life, 20th century society, um, and the, uh, the greenhouse gases, gas effects themselves. So um, it, does, uh, it does get to be quite, uh, quite complex. Let me just make 
one comment here about the difference between the climate and the weather models. Weather models are short term. Climate models are, are models which are uh, probabilistic and they are they're not saying that the weather next week in such a place is going to be wet or dry. Uh, they're saying that it, over the next 30 years it's more likely that so it becomes a probability and that's very important for people to understand. Uh, many people seem to confuse climate with weather. Climate is long term, weather is what's happening today now and next week tomorrow maybe. Okay. So um, I'm going to I'm going to call this uh, call this up call this to an end. Okay. Uh, well, let me just see if this will actually open, and uh, I will pass this into the. Uh, um, I'm going to put this one into the the chat. Hopefully, this is it's quite a quite a, a nice little uh, a nice little model. Um, it's relatively stream, relatively simple, mm -hmm. and I think it's possibly uh, useful for schools. Okay, right. Okay, so Maria Carmen is asking one of the questions of my students in one A so whatever that is, how can they make forecasts? Well, um, I'd suggest I'd suggest that you go, uh, Maria Carmen. I suggest that you look at this website, which I've just put in the in the chat. Um, because this uh, this explains how they do uh, models, but they also have a lot of games and simulations which you can use in class. Um, the other one, and this for me, I think is the uh, is the gold standard uh, of let's say uh, educational and uh, general communication um, uh, around this topic. This is the En-ROADS model and it is incredibly sophisticated considering that it is a um, it is a let's say it's a a public facing it's a public facing um, communications tool. So I would suggest that you check this one out too. This is a bit more complicated. I don't know how old your students are. They might, may find this a little bit too much um, but there is there is a whole set of uh, information around using En-ROADS, and um, I'm quite happy to uh, quite happy to help if you need a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, guidance on this because it's this is a very very interesting uh, very interesting model which uh, allows allows people to say what if ask the questions what if we only have nuclear what if we don't what if we only uh, keep going on with oil um, so I would heartily recommend either En-ROADS or the uh, the, more, the simpler uh, UCAR model okay so it's half past six uh, I'm going to call it uh, call it a day there um, I'd like to thank you for your patience thank you for your uh, uh, for uh, bearing, <laughs> uh, bearing, uh, putting up with me again. Okay, um, so I'd like to wish everyone a, a happy festive season, um, and certainly uh, all the best for uh, all the best for the new year. So thank you very much, and um, I think we can. Uh, we can draw it to a close. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Okay, so I'm just going to close that. Okay, so, okay, happy new year, everyone. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much. And I'm going to call this, bring this to a, bring this to a halt. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to leave.